dementia researcher with a blog and a rating. The ever-growing interdependence of the world's economies, globalisation, has meant we are more connected than ever before. But at what cost? Widening inequality, children living in poverty, people are having to choose between eating or heating. So how can we develop in a more equitable way? Social value is said to be the dimensions by which to progress and hitch to the COVID-19 recovery. Social value attempts to ensure social, economic and environmental outcomes, the triple bottom line, contribute to reducing inequalities and improving well-being and resilience of individuals, communities and society. This is the underpinning concept of my PhD. Under integrated care systems, the voluntary and community sector will play an increasing role in the design and delivery of health services. The government's endeavour for value for money means voluntary community sector organisations will also need to capture the value their activities create to ensure best use of scarce resources. And it is becoming ever clearer that social value is reaching centrality in terms of the framework by which to do so. In this blog I will discuss the progressive shift towards more equitable health systems and why now is a good time for change and argue research needs to align with what is known as the shift in political economy to support wider cultural change that is essential to tackle the big issues that plague society, such as inequalities and environmental degradation. The rise of the global economy has detached itself from reality. Geared towards trade, market-minded policymaking has resulted in social, environmental and economic crises. For example, the UK is the fifth richest country in the world, though how this wealth is distributed in our society is among the worst. While the richest 10% become wealthier, 4.3 million children live in poverty in the UK. That's 31%. This is just one example of many. But a fact I find increasingly baffling is that average subjective well-being, how people experience and evaluate their lives, has remained stagnant since the 70s despite economic growth. This information should contribute to economic and social policy. Yet the Build Back Fairer report highlights how growing inequalities pre-COVID have been exposed and amplified by the pandemic, significantly in the case for people affected by dementia, who have experienced a syndemic. Dementia and COVID-19 have synergised, and along with political, economic and social factors, has caused and exacerbated poor health and inequalities. Surely government doesn't need any more signs that society is seriously unwell. As a political pundit recently said, I would have thought killing your own citizens would have been a line in the sand for government. Though the pandemic provides unfortunate optimism, governments opted for well-being over economic gain in the form of lockdown. As the economy grinded to a halt, governments had no option but to implement policy based on well-being, such as the furlough scheme and the £20 universal credit uplift, as these policies draw attention to what is being produced or depleted in everyday interactions in the form of the various elements that constitute subjective well-being. Take, for instance, health. 80% of a person's health is determined by social factors, and just 20% healthcare. Welcome announcement of funding for health and social care and wider reforms, such as the Additional Roles Reimbursement Scheme and the voluntary and community sector's role in system-level governments and decision-making, which is expected to be announced in April. Again provides some optimism. Political parties even seem optimistically united about the future of social care suggesting care will draw on community-based support, be shaped at local level, and commissioning based on values, what matters to people, rather than funding pressures. However, I would argue, with no detail on how increased funding and money raised through the health and social care levy will be distributed in our society, it is hard to see how visions above materialise. Any efforts to integrate care, level up or build back better, are completely undermined by the deepness of inequalities in the UK. We need a new articulation of value, one geared towards social well-being to progress in a fairer way. Over the past decade or so, a shift in the way we think about our economies has been growing, which is geared towards social, environmental and economic well-being, referred to as social value. This broad concept of value attempts to ensure social, economic and environmental outcomes contribute to reducing inequalities, and improving well-being and resilience of individuals, communities and society. Modern thinkers in the area such as Max Weber, Adam Smith and Karl Marx perhaps did not foresee the role social value is now playing in transforming relations between private, public and third sector organisations 
to ensure services, outcomes and measures better reflect the people and communities they serve. The Big Society was fundamental to the Conservatives' 2010 General Election Manifesto and aimed to reduce public spending and give an enhanced role to the voluntary and community sector in public service delivery based on the added social value they create. This was a significant shift in the way services were commissioned. As such, the Public Services Act was introduced in 2012 to reshape disciplinary ideals, encouraging public authorities to consider proposals based on social value. The NHS long-term plan restates the importance of increasing the voluntary community sector's role in health and social care provision to ensure the success of integrated care reforms. Strong community engagement and innovative ways to improve outcomes for groups with the poorest health makes the voluntary community sector good value for money. Not just politically motivated, though, lead-in research centres such as the Institute for Health Equity recommend incorporating social value in procurement and commissioning to improve health and reduce inequalities. Traditional research design should present a partial picture of value and in some cases misconstrue it. Conventional forms of economic analysis fail to capture wider impacts in modern societies and most outcome measures for community-based interventions in dementia care are not what stakeholders value and lack relevance to non-professionals. Additionally, integrated care systems raise fundamental questions about the nature of value health initiatives such as the Worcestershire Meeting Centre's project should seek to achieve, including how value is captured and measured. This becomes more relevant when recognising only a portion of outcomes will be health-related, but many will support individual, community and society of well-being. Though distinct from objective quantification, the economic benefits of social value can be understood through a variety of specialised methods. One of the most common and comprehensive frameworks for measuring and accounting social value is social return on investment. In my next blog, I will talk in depth about the principles of social return on investment, the framework's strengths and limitations, and what I expect the analysis will tell us about the value of scaling up community-based interventions for people affected by dementia, and how this can support economic, social and environmental development. The impact of many interventions in dementia care will not be realised for people or the system if treated in a narrow, transactional, compliance-based or cost-reduction terms. Demonstrating success and ensuring support and sustainability depends on articulating value that aligns with the shifting political economy. Ta. Thank you for listening. Join the Dementia Research bloggers and share your own views.